Hey everybody, thanks for joining White Dog Outdoors and volume three of our Euronymphing series. Today's video is a continuation of volumes one and two where we've been talking a lot about the basics of urinimphing, the fundamentals, all the things to understand they are gonna kinda help you be successful out there, and then getting into a lot of detail around the gear and the setup. So today's video is a continuation of that setup. It's really the last piece of that setup. This is the last video we're gonna have where we're gonna be in studio. After this, we're gonna be out on the water. But if you, it, this video really assumes that you've seen volumes one and two. So if you haven't seen those videos, I would start there first. I'm gonna have those linked down below in the description watch those videos come here this is the last piece of the rigging and then we will be ready to hit the water also by the time this video launches we will be over 9,000 subscribers and when we hit 10,000 subscribers we are going to be doing a pretty awesome giveaway we're going to be giving away a seven and a half foot three weight beaver metal s glass this is the new s glass by jp ross this is a really sweet rod it's going to be customized it's going to have the white dog logo our new white dog logo on it um, so we're really excited to give that away. We're going to do that when we hit 10,000. So if you're not a subscriber, definitely subscribe. Hit the notifications bell so you can know when we launch that giveaway. All right, we appreciate you joining us. And let's get into Urinimphing Basics for Beginners, Volume 3. Okay, so we've talked a lot about urinimphing leaders, microliters, and the tippet setups that we're gonna use with those, but what's at the end of those lines? It's going to be our flies. And you'll find with urinimphing that most of the time people are using more than one nymph in their setups. And there are a lot of advantages to doing that, but let's first, and we're gonna go into those advantages, but let's first take a step back and say, when do we potentially wanna use just a single fly? The number one reason to use a single fly is that you're regulated to do so. You might not be able to use more than one fly in your rig, and if that's the case, then simply tie your nymph onto the end of your tippet. I use a clinch knot. Simple and done. Just go ahead and go fish, right? If you're allowed multiple flies, what situations might you want to use a single fly? A lot of times, people will use a single fly if they're really trying to do pinpoint casting. So if they've got a lot of different currents with different speeds and they want to hit a very specific spot, they don't want a second nymph hitting a different part of the water that might be faster or slower that's going to affect the drift of the fly of the area that they're aiming for. So that is oftentimes a reason to use a single fly. You can pinpoint cast, get the fly in there, and not have another nymph affecting the drift. So like I mentioned before, people often use multiple rigs in their flies, and there's a lot of advantages for doing that. So you know, number one is having multiple flies gets you more weight in your line. It gets you a better feel between the tip of your rod and your flies. It allows you to attack deeper water. It allows you to get down into the slower water more easily. So that weight really kind of helps. And I always try to avoid putting split shot on my line. I actually never put split shot on my line and I put all the weight in the flies directly. So having multiple flies allows you to be able to get that weight and get a better drift a lot of times and have more control and have more feel just by using that weight. I think one of the big things about using multiple flies is that it helps you learn more about what's going on in the river that particular day. So number one, you can use multiple fly patterns, right? So maybe I use a caddis, maybe I use a stone fly, which one are they taking? And then based on that, I can maybe adjust my flies a little bit more and fine tune and figure things out, right? So it helps you see what's working and what maybe is not working. The other part is it allows you to cover different parts of the water column. So, you know, if I have a heavy fly on the bottom and that one's the one that's ticking bottom, are they taking that? Or are they taking maybe a lighter fly that's further up in the water column? And that helps you understand, are they hugging tight to the bottom and feeding along the bottom? Or are they looking up and maybe feeding on some emerging insects, right? So that's gonna help you figure out a little bit more about what the fish are doing. Plus, whenever you're using multiple nymphs, you always have the chance of catching multiple fish. And that's usually a surprise. It happens actually somewhat frequently if you start urinimphing you're probably going to start catching doubles if you're in any kind of waters that have good populations of fish. It's always a surprise. It's always fun. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a benefit of using multiple flies. Okay, for these next sections, we're going to be doing a little bit of a demo with some, with some lines. So these lines basically represent your tippet, okay? And the, the, the section up here is the piece of your tippet that's going to go up to the rest of your leader, okay? So the rod is this way. Um, 
We're going to go into a little bit about the setup of how we rig this, but I want to start by first understanding some terminology. So when we're using multiple flies in a rig, the fly that's at the bottom is called your point fly. Okay. You may also hear it called an anchor fly, but for the most part, this is going to be called the point fly. For the purposes of our video, whenever I say the point fly, it's going to be the fly on the bottom. Okay. Up above that, off a dropper tag, is this is going to be your dropper. Okay, so dropper and point. Okay, we're going to use that terminology a lot. I want to make sure that that is ingrained in your brain. All right, so this is basically our double nymph rig, and you're going to create the double nymph rig by using two pieces of tippet. Okay, so the first piece of tippet is the piece of tippet that's basically going to come down from your, your leader, and it's going to come down, and this is basically going to create the tag end for our dropper fly. Okay, we're going to overlap our initial tippet with another section of tippet and we're going to try a triple surgeon's knot. And we're going to leave a tag end long enough that we're going to be able to create that dropper and this tag end is generally going to be like six or seven inches or so. And then the other piece of tippet is going to create a 12 to 18 inch section that's going to go down to our point fly. So. Basically, you're going to overlap two pieces of tippet, leave a long enough tag in for a dropper, and leave a nice long piece for your, um, for your point fly. And again, this is a triple surgeon's knot. I'm not going to go through the triple surgeon's knot here, but it's super simple, and there's lots of videos out there that do it. Um, and this is a great way to set up a double nymph rig. So why do I like this setup for a double nymph rig? It leaves two tag ends where the flies are tied individually. And that gives me a lot of flexibility while I'm fishing to be able to change those flies up. So maybe I want to try a different fly pattern. No problem. I change either fly very, very easily. Maybe I want to adjust the depth of which I'm fishing. Maybe I want a heavier fly down here. I can simply remove this fly and tie on another heavy fly. Or maybe I want to try a smaller or lighter fly up above. I can just remove this fly, tie a lighter fly. Very easy for me to adapt and change what I'm doing with this nymph rig. So now you look at this rig and you say, well, they got two tag ends. Aren't I going to get tangled a lot? And that was a legitimate concern that I have when I started this. And to be completely honest, I found that they really didn't tangle anywhere near as much as I thought they would, especially if you're doing a nice oval cast, which we're going to go through in later videos. But if you're casting properly, they tend not to get to, to get tangled up. You know, there are times that they get tangled. We're going to go through those in a later video and how to kind of avoid that stuff. So when I first started nymphing and I wanted to use more than one nymph, I didn't really rig up this way. And it's, it's really kind of a mistake not to. Um, so the, if you think it's going to be simpler to just take your fly, let's forget that this piece exists right here. And we're going to have one piece of tippet here. If we say we're going to tie this fly in right here, and then we're going to tie a second piece of tippet onto the end of this of this bend of the hook. So a lot of people will actually tie onto the bend of a hook and then they'll tie a second piece of tippet onto that. So what happens, so now we got two, two flies basically in line. So what happens when a fish comes up and goes to take this fly up above, right? The fish's mouth is going to come in and it's, you know, it might be prevented from actually closing around that fly. So you might not get as good a hookup percentage on that upper fly. Plus, what happens now when I want to change the depth, I want to change the flies, it's actually a lot more difficult by having two flies in line to be able to change what you're doing. The only thing you can really change is that bottom fly. This upper fly is really not changeable without going through kind of a big hassle. So that's why when you're doing the double nymph rig, it's a lot better to have your two different tag ends where you can have two separate flies and it just ends up being a lot more effective, a lot more versatile and a lot more flexible that way. Okay, so now where do we want to put our flies when we're using a multiple nymph rig? So keep in mind that you may have some flies that are heavier, you may have some flies that are lighter, right? You're going to want to use those different flies in different situations. So typically, how are we going to set this up? Okay, so typically, almost, I don't want to say all the time, but a lot of the time, you're going to have your heavier fly as your point fly. And then you're typically going to have a lighter fly Let's throw in a little caddis here. We're typically going to have a lighter fly as our dropper fly. And why is that? That's because we want to keep as straight a line as possible from the tip of the rod down to your flies. Okay. And so this piece up here is going all the way to my fly rod. I'm going to keep a straight line between these flies 
and my fly rod. Okay, having a heavier fly on your point is gonna allow you to keep a straighter line and having a, a lighter fly up above is gonna allow you to keep a straighter line between the flies and the rod tip. That's gonna help a lot in detecting strikes. Um, and so what happens if you were to put the heavier fly up on, <clears throat> up on, the, um, on the dropper and you had a lighter fly on the point fly? I've now created a hinge. I'm gonna have a straight line from my rod down to, getting a little whacked out here, down to this upper fly, to the dropper, right? But then this longer tag end for the point fly is not gonna be as heavy, and now I'm gonna lose the ability to detect a hit or a strike as, as easily because I don't have a good feel. I've created a hinge, right? I've got an angle here now instead of keeping a straight line. So this is typically why you wanna keep your point fly as your heavy fly, keep a nice straight line all the way down from your flies, and now I'm gonna be able to detect if a, if a fish hits this fly, and I'm gonna be able to detect if a fish hits this fly. They're joined here, and I've got much more sensitivity in being able to, de to detect those strikes. That is typically what you're gonna see with a setup. When might you wanna do something a little bit different? So. You know, so this particular setup is also gonna allow me to cover different parts of the water column, right? So I'm a little angled here. It's probably gonna be a little more straight up like this. I'm gonna have this fly down here and this fly up here. So this fly is gonna go down along the bottom of the water column. He's gonna travel down here. And this fly is gonna travel a little further up, higher up in the water column, right? So that's gonna help you see if they're taking the bottom fly, they're probably hugging tighter to the bottom. And if they're taking the upper fly, maybe they're looking up, looking for, for flies hatching. It's gonna help you understand what's going on in the river, right? You're covering multiple parts of the water column. Okay, so in what situation do I potentially wanna have my heavier fly on the dropper and a lighter fly on the point? This is basically going to cover the same, um, the same depth. It's gonna have two flies going along the bottom of the water column. I will do this during the winter when the fish are usually hugging the bottom in slower, deeper water. I'll use two flies, and that way I have a better chance of figuring out what they want. Do they want a big stone fly, or do they, do, do they want like a, a smaller, um, smaller profile fly? It helps me understand more about what's going on, and I'm covering two flies in the, at the same depth. I don't do this a lot if it's not winter because I wanna be able to cover different parts of the water column, but in the winter, those fish are almost always on the bottom and um, you know, not really looking up. So this gives me an opportunity to find a little bit more out about what's going on and give me more opportunity of finding those fish in cold water conditions. Okay, so the final piece of advice that I'm gonna give you is that, and we've mentioned it throughout this whole section, is pay attention to what the fish are doing, right? This, is, this, this rig is gonna help you understand that. So pay attention, are they taking the fly on the bottom? Are they taking the fly that's above? Are they taking you know, a certain particular pattern? Um, this, is, this rig is really gonna help you understand what exactly is going on with those fish. What kind of mood are they in? What flies do they want? Do they want them low? Do they want them high? Use this as a tool to figure out what the fish want. So I want to talk briefly about the flies that you're going to use when you're urine and We're going to have a separate video that's going to go into incredible amounts of detail on the flies, how we tie them, um, the different patterns that we use, how I select the patterns that I use, everything like that. We're going to go into a lot of detail in another video, um, but for now I want you to basically understand the basics, right? So. With urine and finger, you're typically gonna be using heavier flies, right? So that's one of the basic concepts of urine and finger is maintaining that contact with your flies. The heavier flies are gonna allow you to do that more easily, right? So heavy flies are going to be a big portion of what we do when we're urine and finger. That's a big reason that I tie my own flies, right? So I had trouble finding the flies that I wanted through fly shops and different places like that. And so you, how do you know really They'll say, okay, here's a, here's a hare's ear with a tungsten bead. Okay, well, what size tungsten bead do I have? Is there any lead wrapped in that? How heavy is that really going to feel, right? So that's why 
<laughs> I, I tie a lot of my own leaders, a lot of my own flies, because I want to maintain control of what I'm doing and what I'm feeling. And so those little differences can often make, make, make a difference when I'm fishing. And so I think as you get better, you may want to start exercising more control over your leader, maybe exercising more control over your flies, right? So if you tie your own flies, I think it's really beneficial to tie your own flies when you're anything, just so you can make them the way that you want. So in general, if you tie your own flies, I would tie, I would tie simple patterns to be completely honest. We're going to, we're going to do that in another, in another video, but I would stay with simple patterns for the most part. And I would tie them in different weights, right? So start with a bigger bead and some lead and tie that fly, tie a bunch of that fly. And then, you know, try, tie that same bead, but no lead wraps in, in that fly. And then maybe drop to a smaller bead with lead and then a smaller bead without lead and then so on down. So you have a few different sizes and weights that you can adjust when you're on the river, right? So as I'm fishing different runs, and we talked about this before, the, the way to achieve the drift, the easiest way to achieve the drift and the depth and everything is just by simply changing your flies and by changing the weight in your flies, right? Having that very easily available to you makes a big, big difference. One of the other tips I'll, I'll tell you, and I learned this on my own, was that I, I didn't really have jig style hooks uh, when I first started tying my own nymph. So I was just using a standard nymph hook, um, which is not as big of a bend kind of, um, they weren't barbless hooks. I found that I really struggled to hook the fish effectively and to keep them buttoned up while I was fighting them with a standard nymph hook. And what I found is that when I used the barbless jig hooks, or if I used a caddis style hooks, I had way better hookup percentages on those styles of hooks. So if you're gonna tie your own flies, I would definitely highly recommend either caddis style hooks, or honestly, the, the go-to normal is basically going to be a jig style hook. So again, you know, there's so much detail in this video. I'm gonna link a ton of information down below. I'll link some sample hooks, um, some, some different types of hooks that I would use for tying flies. Um, check out my different fly tying videos. I'll have a list of fly tying videos. I'll show, I, I, I tie all those flies in there. I provide detailed descriptions and the materials that I use for all those different flies. Um, there's some really good, basic, easy patterns to tie. They're just extremely effective. Um, and if you haven't seen the sexy stonefly, go check that out. Now that thing catches all of the big fish. Um, I really, really highly recommend that fly. And it's great as a point fly because you can make them super heavy and they can really get down in deep water. I swear to God, every single big trout I catch is on a sexy stonefly. <laughs> so we're going to keep it there for now with the with kind of going to the flies we're going to have another video where we go way much more into depth on those flies all right so that's going to be a wrap for volume three we have now covered all of the detail that i wanted to cover before we hit the water so we've gone through a ton of detail in the last three volumes now we're ready to hit the water. So the next volumes, the rest of this series is gonna be on the water. This is gonna be the really fun stuff. So I hope you'll join us for that. Again, don't forget about the 10,000 subscriber giveaway. We're gonna be giving away the seven and a half foot three weight Beaver Metal S-Glass, the new S-Glass by JP Ross. And as soon as we hit 10,000, we will be launching a giveaway for that. So definitely subscribe, hit the notifications bell so you know that's coming. Thank you for joining this entire series. We look forward to seeing you for the rest of the series and we'll see you soon.